The state is that organization in society which attempts to maintain a monopoly of the use of force and violence in a given territorial area. It is the only organization in society that obtains its revenue not by voluntary contribution or payment for services rendered, but by coercion. With the rise of democracy, the identification of the state with society has been redoubled until it is common to hear sentiments expressed which violate virtually every tenet of reason and common sense, such as, we are the government. We must emphasize that we are not the government. The government is not us. The government does not in any accurate sense represent the majority of the people. But even if it did, even if 70% of the people decided to murder the remaining 30%, this would still be murder and would not be voluntary suicide on the part of the slaughtered minority. The useful collective term, we, has enabled an ideological camouflage to be thrown over the reality of political life. If, quote, we are the government, then anything a government does to an individual is not only just and untyrannical, but also voluntary on the part of the individual concerned. If the government conscripts a man or throws him into jail for dissident opinion, then he is doing it to himself, and therefore nothing untoward has occurred. Under this reasoning, any Jews murdered by the Nazi government were not murdered, Instead, they must have committed suicide, since they were the government, which was democratically chosen. One would not think it necessary to belabor this point, and yet the overwhelming bulk of the people hold this fallacy to a greater or lesser degree. If the government has incurred a huge public debt, which must be paid by taxing one group for the benefit of another, this reality of burden is obscured by saying that, quote, we owe it to ourselves. What is the moral basis for imposing massive obligations on future generations in the name of bread and circuses? The difference is we, America own, owes itself. If we don't do something to control healthcare costs and we don't have more revenue, things are gonna blow up, but why exactly? Do we have to decide now how we're going to deal with those things in the year 2030? In 1787, federal spending was about $3 million a year, or about $1 per citizen. By 1929, the federal government spent $3 billion a year. And they, they went up to $29 per person. Today, the federal government spends over $4 billion per day, and that comes to $6,000 per person, and controlling for inflation, that represents a 9,000% increase in federal spending between 1929 and today. Our founding fathers, who were paying about 67 cents a year in taxes, they went to war with Great Britain claiming that taxation without representation is tyranny. Man is born naked into the world and needing to use his mind to learn how to take the resources given him by nature and to transform them into shapes and forms and places where the resources can be used for the satisfaction of his wants and the advancement of his standard of living. If mankind is left to his own devices, he would settle down and naturally be a capitalist. Capitalism, free markets, laissez-faire, whatever name we might give to the process where property is privately held and mankind goes about his ordinary business engaging in peaceable 
voluntary exchange. Mann has found that through the process of voluntary mutual exchange, the productivity and hence the living standards of all participants in exchange may increase enormously. The only natural course for man to survive and to attain wealth, therefore, is to engage in the production and exchange process. Everyone is born poor and ignorant. To the extent that people become different, we have to find out what are the things that enable them to become different and how can those opportunities be more widely generalized. I, I regard poverty as just simply the absence of wealth. So what I look for are the things that cause wealth to occur. But there are certain peculiar circumstances that have arisen in a few countries on the face of the earth, and only relatively recently in human history, that has made the kind of affluence that exists in the United States or Western Europe or Japan uh, commonplace in these countries. So what I'm interested in is what peculiar set of circumstances have caused that to come about. The great German sociologist Franz Oppenheimer pointed out that there are two mutually exclusive ways of acquiring wealth. One, the way of production and exchange, he called the economic means. The other way is simpler in that it does not require productivity. It is the way of seizure of another's goods or services by the use of force and violence. This is the method which Oppenheimer termed the political means to wealth. It should be clear that the peaceful use of reason and energy in production is the natural path for man, the means for his survival and prosperity on earth. It should be equally clear that the coercive, exploitive means is contrary to natural law. It is parasitic, for instead of adding to production, it subtracts from it. The political means siphons production off to a parasitic and destructive individual or group and this siphoning not only subtracts from the number producing, but also lowers the producer's incentive to produce beyond his own subsistence. In the long run, the robber destroys his own subsistence by dwindling or eliminating the source of his own supply. Wealth is created when the circumstances are such that people who know how to create it are free to do so. We are now in a position to answer more fully the question, what is the state? The state, in the words of Oppenheimer, is the organization of the political means. It is the systematization of the predatory process over a given territory. For crime, at best, is sporadic and uncertain. The parasitism is ephemeral, and the coercive parasitic lifeline may be cut off at any time by the resistance of the victims. The state provides a legal, orderly, systematic channel for the predation of private property. It renders certain, secure, and relatively, quote, peaceful, the lifeline of the parasitic caste in society. Since production must always precede predation, the free market is anterior to the state. The state has never been created by a, quote, social contract, it has always been born in conquest and exploitation. One method of the birth of a state may be illustrated as follows. In the hills of southern Ruritania, a bandit group manages to obtain physical control over the territory. And finally, the bandit chieftain proclaims himself king of the sovereign and independent government of South Ruritania. And if he and his men have the force to maintain this rule for a while, lo and behold, a new state has joined the family of nations, and the former bandit leaders have been transformed into the lawful nobility of the realm. Since the land area of the globe has been parceled out among particular states, one of the basic doctrines of the state was to identify itself with the territory it governed. Since most men tend to love their homeland, the identification of the land and its people with the state was a means of making natural patriotism work to the state's advantage. 
Yes, take children from the faith of their fathers and teach them the state is the only church. And the head of the state is the voice of God. In this way, a war between rulers was converted into a war between peoples, with each people coming to the defense of its rulers in the erroneous belief that the rulers were defending them. This device of, quote, nationalism has only been successful in Western civilization in recent centuries. It was not too long ago that the mass of subjects regarded wars as irrelevant battles between various sets of nobles. In war, state power is pushed to its ultimate, and under the slogans of defense and emergency, it can impose a tyranny upon the public such as might be openly resisted in time of peace. War thus provides many benefits to a state, and indeed every modern war has brought to the warring peoples a permanent legacy of increased state burdens upon society. Not just your duty, but your privilege to help your government by paying your tax and paying it promptly. Oh, what's the big hurry? What's the big hurry? Your country is at war. Your country needs taxes for guns. Machine guns, anti-tank guns, long-range guns, 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 all kinds of guns. Ah! Congressman Paul, Vice President Biden has said we'll be out of Afghanistan, pulling troops out, you know, in three years, come hell or high water. Do you, do you buy that? Why would they be building all these military bases, building billion dollar embassies in Pakistan, Afghanistan and Iraq? I mean, they have no intention on leaving. The people know that. And that, that's why they hate our guts. And that's why they're disgusted. And that's why we're bankrupt. Because, you know, uh, war is the health of the state. Anybody who wants small government, conservatives and the constitutionalist libertarians, if they want small government, they have to understand that war is the health of the state. Through the centuries, men have formed concepts designed to check and limit the exercise of state rule. And one after another, the state, using its intellectual allies, has been able to transform these concepts into intellectual rubber stamps of legitimacy and virtue to attach to its decrees and actions. The concept of parliamentary democracy began as a popular check upon absolute monarchical rule. It ended with parliament being the essential part of the state and its every act totally sovereign. All Americans are familiar with the process by which the construction of limits in the Constitution has been inexorably broadened over the last century. The state has, in the process, largely transformed judicial review itself from a limiting device to yet another instrument for furnishing ideological legitimacy to the government's actions. The state has invariably shown a striking talent for the expansion of its powers beyond any limits that might be imposed upon it. Since the state necessarily lives by the compulsory confiscation of private capital, and since its expansion necessarily involves ever greater incursions on private individuals and private enterprise, we must assert that the state is profoundly and inherently anti-capitalist. In a sense, our position is the reverse of the Marxist dictum that the state is the executive committee of the ruling class in the present day, supposedly the capitalists. Instead, the state, the organization of the political means, constitutes and is the source of the ruling class, and is in permanent opposition to genuinely private capital. The way to look at taxes is to see taxes as government claims on private property. That is, if government were to tax private property 100%, it would confiscate private property. And indeed, taxes are going up. Private property and free enterprise are mere skeletons of their past. 
And indeed, Thomas Jefferson anticipated this when he said, the natural progress of things is for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield. Once a state has been established, the problem of the ruling group, or caste, is how to maintain their rule. Since predation must be supported out of the surplus of production, it is necessarily true that the class constituting the state must be a rather small minority in the land. While force is their modus operandi, their basic and long-run problem is ideological. For in order to continue in office, any government must have the support of the majority of its subjects. This support, it must be noted, need not be active enthusiasm. It may well be passive resignation, as if to an inevitable law of nature. Promoting this ideology among the people is the vital social task of the, quote, intellectuals. For the masses of men do not create their own ideas, or indeed think through these ideas independently. They follow passively the ideas adopted and disseminated by the body of intellectuals. The state is willing to offer the intellectuals a secure and permanent birth in the state apparatus, and thus a secure income and the panoply of prestige. Many and varied have been the arguments by which the state and its intellectuals have induced their subjects to support their rule. The union of church and state was one of the oldest and most successful of these ideological devices. The ruler was either anointed by God, or in the case of the absolute rule of many oriental despotisms, was himself God. Hence, any resistance to his rule would be blasphemy. The state's priestcraft performed the basic intellectual function of obtaining popular support and even worship for the rulers. In the present more secular age, the divine right of the state has been supplemented by the invocation of a new god, science. State rule is now proclaimed as being ultra-scientific, as constituting planning by experts. But while quote, reason is invoked more than in previous centuries, this is not the true reason of the individual and his exercise of free will. It is still collectivist and determinist, still implying holistic aggregates and coercive manipulation of passive subjects by their rulers. This is the way a student goes through college nowadays. In literature, economics, philosophy, sociology, and other subjects, the student is continually subjected to data and interpretations that converge on a single point, the viciousness of private enterprise and the virtuousness of state intervention. Our decision is as follows. No more private property. No more you. What people experience in the universities is then reinforced, of course, by the media, by the cultural establishment, by the churches. And specifically, it is the morality and way of looking at the world of the classes that are sheltered from the market by the circumstance that they live from taxes. Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. The psychological shock when, when they will see in future what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it. When a military boot crashes his then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kind of goodies and the paradise on earth, to destabilize your uh, economy, 
to eliminate the principle of free market competition and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., there must be a very strong effort to explain them the real danger of socialist, communist, welfare state. If people will fail to grasp the impending danger of that development, nothing ever can help the United States. You may kiss goodbye to your freedom. who know nothing of any time but their own, who are completely in the dark as to the manner of powers behaving through thousands of years, would regard these proceedings as the fruit of a particular set of doctrines. They are in fact the normal manifestations of power and differ not at all in their nature from Henry VIII's confiscation of the monasteries. The same principle is at work the hunger for authority, the thirst for resources, and in all of these operations the same characteristics are present, including the rapid elevation of the dividers of the spoils. Stripped of its academic jargon, the welfare state is nothing more than a mechanism by which governments confiscate the wealth of the productive members of a society to support a wide variety of welfare schemes. We have in our country what some scholars call the tragedy of the commons, whereby it pays for everybody to use government in attempt to steal from everybody else. A substantial part of the confiscation is affected by taxation. Every worker in the country, farmers, bank presidents, streetcar conductors, dentists, teachers, clerks, mechanics, even unskilled laborers, work three months of every year to pay for what government spends. The thing that, about the welfare state is that when you start on this route, everything goes fine. To begin with, you are imposing taxes on 90% of the people, small taxes, and are able to give considerable benefits to 10% of the people. And then you ultimately get to the position where 100% of the people are paying taxes in order to provide benefits to 100% of the people. Using government to achieve these objectives means trying to do good with someone else's money. Nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. And therefore, you are going to have waste and ultimately fiscal catastrophe. You cannot do good with someone else's money unless you first take it away from them. And therefore, force, coercion, is at the very heart of the welfare state. The welfare statists were quick to recognize that if they wished to retain political power, the amount of taxation had to be limited and they had to resort to programs of massive deficit spending. In other words, they had to borrow money by issuing government bonds to finance welfare expenditures on a large scale. Under a gold standard, the amount of credit that an economy can support is determined by the economy's tangible assets, since every credit instrument is ultimately a claim on some tangible asset. But government bonds are not backed by tangible wealth, only by the government's promise to pay out of future tax revenues. The abandonment of the gold standard made it possible for the welfare status to use the banking system as a means to an unlimited expansion of credit. As the supply of money, of claims, increases relative to the supply of tangible goods in the economy, prices must eventually rise. Thus, the earnings saved by the productive members of the society lose value in terms of goods. In the absence of the gold standard, 
there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. That's what inflation is, is a subtle tax. It's an unseen tax, and it's a regressive tax that affects the poorer at a greater proportion than the wealthy. Just as the two basic and mutually exclusive interrelations between men are peaceful cooperation or coercive exploitation, production or predation, Albert J. Nock happily termed these contesting forces social power and state power. So the history of mankind may be considered as a contest between these two principles. If the 17th through the 19th centuries were, in many countries of the West, times of accelerating social power and a corollary increase in freedom, peace, and material welfare, the 20th century has been primarily an age in which state power has been catching up with a consequent reversion to slavery, war, and destruction. In this century, the human race faces once again the virulent reign of the state, of the state now armed with the fruits of man's creative powers, confiscated and perverted to its own aims. Thank you and good night. Of all the numerous forms that governments have taken over the centuries, of all the concepts and institutions that have been tried, none has succeeded in keeping the state in check. Perhaps new paths of inquiry must be explored if the successful, final solution of the state question is ever to be attained. I think if you take away the government's ability to expand the monetary base, given enough time, the rest of the issues sort themselves out because it realigns the incentives back to sound economics, back to fairer participation in an actually productive society. So I think if you could take away the government's ability to print wealth, because we're always going to have organizations that are in charge. There's always going to be somebody that has more power than you. And as much as I'd love to see an anarcho-capitalist society exist, you know, gulch gulch, so to speak, if it were to happen tomorrow, right, the power vacuum would be uh, enormous and, and we might end up in a worse place than we are today. That said, if I, if I could hit the button and just simply stop the ability of the governments to create money and finance debt, I think that a lot of the problems would sort themselves out within a generation.